Thank you, and thanks for the worst selfie ever, Brian. That's uh, awesome. So I'm a paediatric anaesthetist. I also work for the National Pre-Hospital and Retrieval Service in Scotland. So like many of you, it's inevitable as part of my job that I will encounter children in traumatic cardiac arrest. I have to be ready to manage this. So, oops. so and what can I share with you? The world's elite resuscitationists about the management of traumatic cardiac arrest. You all have well-framed mental models, slick SOPs, backed up with regular sim training. Can I ask if the next job you're tasked to is a child in cardiac arrest, are you ready to deliver your best? Do you use an SOP a protocol like this? Well, why not? Okay, I'm a strong believer in the mantra that children are small adults. Treat children, especially in the resuscitation situation, where using a familiar SOP helps preserve some resuscitation momentum by cognitive offloading. But something's been niggling me about traumatic cardiac arrest. I've been inspired to dig a little deeper into this. My inspiration comes from the number 44 bus in Edinburgh. I'll come back to this. But it's been very difficult for me to to dig out the data on traumatic cardiac arrests in children. Less than one publication per year on this topic over the last 30 years, and survivor numbers that literally you can count on one hand. I'm going to clarify, I am only going to talk about blunt traumatic arrests. The survival from and the management of penetrating cardiac arrests in children parallels that of adults, and with a 10 to 20 percent survival rate depending on the service reporting. Okay, so what is the incidence? Okay, the population incidence is around 1 in 100,000. In Scotland, here's Scotland in midsummer, we have around 1 million children. Okay, so we would expect to see, and we do see, around 10 traumatic cardiac arrests per year in children. Small numbers. If you work in a large major, major trauma centre emergency department, around 1 in 20,000 attendances will be child in traumatic arrest. A wee bit more, if you work in an enhanced pre-hospital trauma team, around 1 in 50 taskings to a child in traumatic arrest. The numbers are low. But these can be deeply personal cases, especially when you reflect on images on the news websites of children that you've seen die in front of you a few days previously. So, who are our patients? Who are we likely to be tasked to? Is it these guys safely crossing the road? Is it this little thug taking a few more chances in, in life? The data would tell us we're most likely to be tasked to a child, obviously, a child aged seven years old, median age. 80% boys, okay. 50% of traumatic arrests in children result from incidents involving motor vehicles with falls and non-accidental injury making up the rest. Their injury severity score is high, 40 to 50. But who are the survivors? Okay, I've just very crudely collated data from the most recent papers looking at blunt traumatic arrests in children. It makes for pretty grim reading. In blue, you can see survivors up the left, 30 actual numbers. In green, the total number of reported arrests, 2,500. So, okay, we say 1% survival rate, give or take, it's better than zero. Okay, but these data are pulled from many heterogeneous and retrospective studies. And the more recent studies actually detail the individual injuries and outcomes of survivors. And of this 1%, only one third are neurologically intact. Who are the survivors? Survivors are overrepresented by children who have sustained asphyxial type blunt traumatic arrests, drowning. 20% survival, crush injuries, high cervical cord injuries. My interpretation of these is that these are primary, primarily traumatic respiratory arrests. And we know from medical arrests that the management of, me of respiratory causes fare better. Who fares worse? 80% okay. of children who die due to trauma die because of traumatic brain injury. And I wonder how much of a case brain impact apnea has to play in this. I've certainly been aware of three cases over the last few years of this, where a child appears to be in complete cardiorespiratory collapse within minutes of injury without signs of mass major blood loss. We need to be ready to treat this or bear this in mind when we start treatment for a child in traumatic arrest. Okay, so most will not survive, but surely we should go all in. These are kids, these are our future. And whilst the futility is the expectation, the social and economic gains of survivors are massive. So do we not pull more kit out of the bags? Do we not fly lower, drive faster? No, we must not. We must use our clinical expertise to hone in on potential survivors and go all in on them. And for those that will not survive, we limit unnecessary treatments and we limit unnecessary risk to our teams. So what enables us to prognosticate on the potential survivors? Cardiac rhythm, this sounds obvious. Okay, but if your child is in asystole, which 60% of them will be, they will not survive. There has never been a reported survivor of asystolic blunt traumatic arrest in children. And if you've had one, you have to tell us about it, because I can't find it. Okay, 
about 30% will be in PEA, 5 to 10% in VF, and these are the good categories. So, what's next? Signs of life. Again, this sounds obvious, but all reported survivors of blunt traumatic arrests in children have had either vital signs or signs of life, even just pupillary response, present either at the scene or in the emergency department. But we can all relate to the difficulties in assessing these in children. Maybe we should turn to a more objective measure to back up our clinical assessment of signs of life. As demonstrated, a patient who clinically was an asystolic cardiac arrest, but we can clearly see some organised cardiac activity. Are you ready? Do you have the capability to do a roadside echo in a child in traumatic arrest? So, we've got vital signs. We've got a cardiac rhythm. Should we, perform, should we carry on to chest surgery? Well, no. Again, the data would tell us that unless you have a hole in your chest performing a thoracotomy for open chest CPR in a child, will not or has not yielded a survivor. Again, because the primary cause of death is brain injury. So where does this leave us? Well, it leaves me to a big slice of humble pie. Children are small adults. Maybe not for blunt traumatic arrest. Most of the impact energy is sustained by the brain, often shearing spinal cord pathways in the process. Aside from the fact, children are normally have been perfectly healthy pre-incident. So when the injury overcomes their massive physiological reserve, this is a decompens decompensatory state that will usually lead to death. So back to my number 44 bus. A couple of months ago, the oldest mini-me ran in front of a number 44 bus. The bus stopped, just. I don't think the driver's coronaries will ever be the same again. But I thought at the time, what would I do had that bus not stopped? And more importantly, what would I want you to do if you're the pre-hospital team tasked to treat my boy? Okay, what do I do? I start CPR. Starting BLS within five minutes of the injury has been proven to double survival rates. When you arrive, you start aggressive ALS. Okay, bearing in mind the brain impact apnea might be a cause, causative factor here, and tailoring therapy is as appropriate for that. You do not perform a thoracotomy, thank you very much. Okay, and you rapidly triage him to the major trauma centre. And if there is, if he's in asystole, with signs of a head injury and no signs of life, he is not going to survive. And we all need to be ready to manage that appropriate to our operating environment. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Tom.